On this edition of InCycle, we look at some of the great and not so good cycling jerseys of the past. If you ask people what were their top five least favourite jersey designs, most people would have uh, the Le Groupe Mont. We learn how to form and catch a breakaway. When you get in a group and it goes, and then you hear it in the radio from your teammate, go Adam, go, 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 then you know, okay, the break's going to go. But first, we meet the French cycling icon, Thomas Vauclair. Strong, colourful characters is what we all look for in the peloton. And rarely has anyone stood out more than Tom Avoclair. His iconic gurn and passionate attacks make him nothing short of a national hero in France. Thomas Vauclair belongs to a generation of in-between in French cycling. We had a generation of great champions with Anctil, Poulidor, then Bernardino, Fignon. And there was a, a little bit of a lull. After the Festina scandal, there was a, a whole generation of, of French riders didn't perform so well. Now we have a new generation with Romain Bardet, Thibaut Pinot, Warren Barguil, all these guys. And in between those two generations, almost the only uh, popular rider or the only French rider who really had you know, great results and in the same time was popular because he's a nice guy, was uh, Thomas Vauclair. Although lacking the natural ability to ever win the Tour de France, Vauclair endeared himself to many with four stage wins and a total of 20 days in the yellow jersey over his 15 appearances. As he rounded off an extraordinary career in 2017, InCycle met a man who had long shouldered the pressure and expectation of a nation at the biggest race of them all. C'est sûr que depuis 2004, quand j'ai eu le maillot jaune la première fois, j'ai senti que il y a toujours une place à prendre dans le cœur du public. Il y a eu Richard Viranque, il y a eu Laurent Lachalabert, et puis après, c'est vrai que le public a besoin d'un Français qui qui soutient. Et moi, je me suis battu entre guillemets contre. Voilà, j'étais un petit jeune Français. Contre les favoris du général, j'étais pas très fort, j'étais juste, je donnais juste toute mon énergie et ça, les Français, ils ont bien aimé que je suis un coureur qui attaque beaucoup. Donc voilà, ça s'est fait comme ça s'est fait comme ça et puis euh, je pense que je suis resté aussi simple et c'est ça qui a permis. Je suis comme tout le monde en fait et c'est peut-être pour ça que les gens qu'il y a une bonne connexion avec le public. For many reasons, he is, he's very popular in France because he rides the way the French like a rider to, to ride. He's offensive, aggressive, and at the same time, always a smile on his face. He's very distinctive. You can tell Thomas Vaucler from other riders because, you know, he sticks his leg in, in a race. So he's, he's full of character, he's full of, he's full of passion. He's, he's not really a grand tour rider, even if he came fourth in the tour in 2011, but he had a little bit of luck. He's a nice guy. In the morning, you know, when most riders are tense and they don't want to talk, or he's always available for the for the public, for the, for kids. He's like your ideal uh, brother-in-law. Si vous voulez jouer un rôle devant les caméras, le Tour de France c'est tellement difficile que vous êtes tellement fatigué qu'il y a un moment où c'est pas possible de jouer un rôle. Il faut si vous êtes pas naturel. Il y a obligatoirement un moment où euh, ça ne marche pas parce que c'est trop difficile. On peut, quand on est fatigué, quand on est stressé, euh, on ne peut pas jouer de rôle. Euh, ça peut arriver au calme de, de, de répondre euh, un peu à côté, comme les, des fois des hommes politiques, un petit peu orienter les réponses. Mais quand juste après une course ou juste avant une course, le, nat la nat le, le naturel y ressort, la personnalité. Donc je... J'ai toujours parlé euh, aux, aux médias ou au public comme je parle dans la vie de tous les jours. In France, we never, it's changing a little bit, we, but we never really liked winners, you know. We, 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 we're more a nation who likes beautiful losers, you know. You, 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 we'd rather see someone attack, do something absolutely exceptional with flair and lose than someone been, you know, calculating, 
with lots of tactics and 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 win. We, we really like cycling to to still be uh, flamboyant, you know, uh, to have some kind of a, a, what we call panache. Well, Thomas Vorkler is really, that, that's what he has, what we call panache. Panache is what the musketeers had, you know? This is the way they, they fought and, you know, they're, they're all together, all for one and one for all. It's that this kind of tradition uh, in France, uh, Thomas Vaucler is, is kind of a new musketeer. With Vaucler gone, it hasn't taken long for France's new musketeer to emerge. Renato Philippe hits the front, Nason trying to get on turns, and here comes Alain Philippe to another famous victory. This time he takes the monument. Alain Philippe may possess his own style on the bike, but it's unlikely he'll ever be described with no words at all. In cycling, the humble jersey is part of the sport's vivid colour, moving billboards trying to stand out against a vibrant bunch. Two men who appreciate this more than most are Mick Tarrant and Andy Storey, specialists in jersey reproduction at Prenda Ciclismo. Their collection spans decades and chart the development of style and manufacturing techniques over the years. Who better then to look back at some of the classics and shockers of yesteryear? It was a Dutch team, but they were they were a super team, you know. They they hoovered up the best riders and won just about everything. Incredibly long, <laughs> they used to cut them. That's a size two, which equates to a small now. Marginal gains were really, really minimal with jerseys such as this because they weren't uh, manufactured to fit riders specifically. Uh, they were so, well, what size are you? You're a, sm you're a small, right? Here you go, here's your size two. Of course, the, the flock lettering actually enabled them to produce more complex logos. So, for example, the, the DR Rally and the Campagnolo, uh, that, that would actually be quite a simple process with flock lettering, whereas with embroidery, it'd be a really labour-intensive uh, process. We had a, a big box of Santini wool jerseys turn up one day. Uh, the Brooklyn was one of the first that we fished out, and it was one of the first that we decided to reproduce in, in modern fabrics. Uh, we love the look of it. Labour intensive is just, it's off the scale because each individual panel is stitched together on each individual stripe. The Brooklyn Bridge is embroidered. Phenomenal. It just must have cost so much to produce. Obviously, it's uh, based on the Mondrian uh, artwork. This jersey is an oddity, actually, because this, when Santini made this jersey, they were actually sublimating polyester, uh, which, as you can imagine, was probably not such a bad idea, given the complexity of the jersey. Uh, but at the time, Bernardino wasn't quite ready to accept polyester as a jersey fabric. <laughs> if you actually turn them inside out, uh, all, the, all the panels are stitched together here. Um, so I'd imagine the, the production staff probably weren't best pleased to have to make something for, you know, but he was the boss. But for some reason, they went from the Mondrian pattern to, to this one. Um, I quite like it now. At the time, <laughs> the Toshiba was a, was a regular uh, jersey in, in the bargain bin. Um, but, uh, you know, I, like, looking back on it now, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's so it's bad, but at the time, nobody liked it. If you ask people what were their top five least favourite jersey designs, most people would have uh, the Le Groupement uh, jersey in the list. It's, um, I don't know what it is about it. I think there's a... <laughs> Part of the problem was is the team collapsed, you know. So that that's part of it, I think. You know, people can still remember that happening. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's pretty awful, really. The benefit of hindsight, I think I detested it at the time, mm. like you said, you know, with the Toshiba. But I've actually 
probably wouldn't wear it, but I grew to like it. But it was quite artfully done because the, it faded through from a very dark blue into a very light blue. Um, some people would call it gross because there's that fuchsia on the yellow. Uh, but oddly, we actually we do quite like we do mm. quite like it. You know, lots of riders are associated with one, one jersey in particular, and, and Marco Pantani, it, you know, is, is, is always remembered as Marco Tony. You know, um, many people probably normally remember the year after this one, the '98, mm -hmm. because that's when he was riding a Bianchi. But this is the year before, and this is our this is our preferred look. You, you mentioned this the other day. Whenever you see Pantani pictured in this particular year, it's you, about ten sizes too big for yeah, him. Yeah, he never seems to have a jersey that fits him. When Mappe finished, uh, Santini had a huge inventory. We bought everything. A lot of the stuff we bought had the rider names on the back, and the muse the museos etc. went almost immediately. But then there were other ones with like Cancellara, Isil. Nobody wanted those, did mm, they? Mm. <laughs> yeah, they were really slow to go. I don't know. It has its fans. I can see the appeal. Through all that's changed in cycling's history, it feels like there's been one constant, the breakaway. Failing far more than it succeeds, to some, it's a hopeless mission. For others, it's an opportunity. While the breakaway and catch appear a choreographed routine practiced by the peloton and a select few chances, what's really going on? To find out, InCycle consulted some of those who best know this side of racing to break down the art of the breakaway. When you see action from the beginner riders right, attacking, they angry, they want to go in the breakaway. Then breakaway happens, then they fighting for uh, second bonus, uh, for bonus, uh, for seconds, for uh, KOM. That's already excitement, that's already that people want to see. When a breakaway gets to the finish, you have to beat them. And the strange thing is when you win in a breakaway, it could actually be one of the easiest races to win because you're not racing the peloton, you're just racing the people in the breakaway. There's riders out there that are just, they're, they're just having fun to bring the breakaway back. I think for me, the, the best feeling is at the start of the race, there's heaps of jumping, you know, and you're a little break, so you get like 10 seconds away, and then you get caught, and then you go another move, and this happens quite a lot. But when you, you get in a group and it goes, and then you hear in the radio from your teammate, go Adam, go, 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 the bunch has stopped, then you know, okay, the break's going to go. With breakaways forming long before television audiences usually join the action, just how the escapees got away can be a mystery to even the most ardent cycling fan. From the moment the flag drops at kilometre zero, those motivated to make the day's break often launch their attack. And for the wise heads of the peloton, it isn't usually hard to guess who might be making a dash for it. I always make jokes, it's like, whose birthday is it? Uh, who's living in the town we pass? And uh, so you do a little bit of uh, research on the internet. So these guys are definitely up for it, they know the region. And then you have a look, okay, who can we let go? It's like, is it a tough stage, a long stage? If it's a long stage, we you can let go of six riders, no problem. If it's a short stage or shorter one, three to four is perfect. So for us, uh, it literally starts uh, at kilometer zero. With the likes of Eisel intensely monitoring and shutting down any threats to GC leadership or sprint ambitions, the formation of the breakaway isn't always immediate. If riders fighting like and no one is getting away, uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, at one point we need to tell one rider just listen, take it a little bit easy and stay there in the front because right now everybody's getting tired of those attacks, it will go. and. Uh, 
five, ten minutes later, boom, the breakaway is gone. And then we, okay, our first part, mission accomplished, so now let's focus on the second part of the race. Some of the unwritten rules of the breakaway is everyone should do the same amount of work. Um, that's something that obviously everyone wants and we, we don't like, like it when the riders are sort of, they pretend they're not so good and things like this. You show you're motivated, you show you want to go to the finish and everyone feels a little guilty conscious if they don't do the same. So they all put in the same amount of work. And I think this is important for the breakaway to get to the finish. Even with cooperation integral to ultimate breakaway success, decisions on how to beat the fellow escapees need to be made early. And for that, riders have their director sportifs nearby to help devise a plan. We can communicate directly with the athlete and provide him all information that he needed. And uh, of course, uh, the first goal is to motivate him and to provide him uh, right advice because if he's in the breakaway with uh, super strong guys and you know in the case that we get to the finish and he he's not going to be doing so well so we try to help him to save his legs a little bit. To the untrained eye catching a breakaway looks simple. For those hoping to set up a sprint though there are hidden dangers catch too early and a fresher rider can spoil the day, leave it too late and a sprint train is disrupted. So when making the calculation, do we stick to tradition or let science give the road captains a hand? My name is Henrik from Oldham and I'm a professor um, in mathematics at the University of Ghent. And I was once asked to develop a formula um, to know uh, at which distance uh, the a peloton should start to hunt a breakaway in order to catch up with them. So I put together two, two formulas. One formula is very simple, the other one contains a square root, so it looks rather impressive. <laughs> the information that you need to have is, uh, first, uh, the number of riders in the breakaway, right? Because it depends on that. Then you also need to know uh, the speed, the, sp the speed of the of the breakaway, that's essential. Um, the other thing you need to know is um, the distance between them, between the peloton and the, and the riders, obviously. Otherwise, yeah. And then what you also need to know is the the speed of the peloton once they are chasing. But that should be something that you know from other stages. That once the peloton starts chasing, how fast can can they ride? I received a lot of data of um, uh, rides ag against the time and um, there it seemed that when there are more than 10 riders the speed remained constant. There was no, no re reducing of, of the speed but while, when there are more, less than 10 riders then they get tired and then there is a certain, let's say, uh, they, they, they lose some, some speed. And that's the main reason why there are two formulas. So x is equal to APV divided by P minus V in the first formula. And in the second formula, x is equal to A times P times 6P divided by 3 times P minus V plus the square root of 6PAC plus 9 times P minus V squared and this minus one. Wow, that's a... Somebody has a lot of time. <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, I don't know what to say. Oh, well, for us, it's 10 minutes per kilometer. <laughs> <laughs> I think Kev would definitely buy into this if he, if he explained it to him the right way and you can see, you can prove it's, uh, it's right. It's, uh, and I, I guess it's right. <laughs> But how does it feel to be one of those swallowed up by the peloton when that 100 plus kilometre effort comes to nothing? I'd much rather be in the breakaway, get caught and have an easy day in the peloton. So uh, I'll take it any day. And there's always, there's, there's always that chance it goes to the line. So you should never, um, you should never feel bad about it. 
There are days in cycling when absolutely no formula will help catch the brake. Days where the motivation to hold off the peloton is great enough. Days where the elements shine bright on the escapees, but not the chasers. Inside the final kilometer, 800 meters remaining. Tails on the front, the Italians behind them. It's Maestri that uh, free wheels, and nobody wants to take it up, and they can't afford to do this. They cannot afford to do this. They must ride it all the way, because look at the rate of the sprint behind as they wind up. Groupama FT Shea, they're going for a dance around the road, and they can't do it. They want to time it to absolute perfection. But they're inside the final 500 meters now, and now it's the launch. Dens goes for glory. Can Maestri stay with him? Chima in his way. He tries to get the gap. Maestri is fighting to stay in the wheel. Maestri is there waiting to launch. Dens it is. He goes for the long one. He's fired first. Maestri goes. Chima on the opposite side of the road. They're going to be swamped as uh, Tamar comes from behind. Tamar launches. Ackerman on the left. And it looks like they're going to be caught in the run to the line, or are they? Chima has the gap. Chima to the line. Damian Achima! Who is just about hangs on. Damian Achima gets the victory. He gets stage 18 of Giro d'Italia. The breakaway survived by the narrowest of margin. You will not see a more thrilling sprint finish. With victories like that of Chima, it's no wonder riders have and always will chance their luck in the breakaway. That's all for this edition. Until next time, keep up to date with us on social media.